So welcome everyone. We are on kit 134A today, blind tasting with Master the World. My name is Lee Ming Stroh. I am the co-founder and CEO of Master the World, and I'm here in San Carlos, California. Evan Goldstein, I'll bring you up first. Where are you coming in from today? I am coming in from my dining room in um, a sunny San Francisco, which if anyone was watching the weather over the last couple of days, it's been wacky and hellacious. It was pouring uh, yesterday at points, uh, both here in the Bay Area, uh, in San Francisco and down south, but I'm happy to say the sun is back up, which is where it should be in September. Awesome. Madeline, where are you coming in from? I'm coming in from perfect weather in uh, southeastern Michigan. Our humidity has dropped finally. Yippee. And though it's probably not quite as nice as Joey is enjoying up north in Leland Peninsula. Great. And of course, we have Master Sommelier, Tim Gazer. Tim? Hey, everybody. <clears throat> uh, sunny New Mexico. This is the most beautiful time of year here. Uh, it's in the mid to high 80s and the 60s at night, golden light, leaves starting to turn, and it's the best time of year to be here. So glad to be with you today. Awesome. We have some amazing wines today. Six wines, of course. If it's your first time, feel free to ask any questions. I think we've stopped using our Q&A. We've just thrown the Q&A right into the <laughs> chat, which I love. I love this dialogue. I love the encouragement. I love everybody trying to answer everybody else's questions, too. Love all that. Love your reactions. We're going to have polls today, too. So for some reason, you don't have the wine and you're tasting along with us. We'll give you the clues. You can guess along on the poll. Uh, for those of you who have the wine, yay. I think you'll have a great time. Madeline, I'm going to kick it off with you with wine number one. OK, and I try I will try to do this in a timely fashion. I know sometimes I drag my feet on wine number one. Um, I will remind us all that I'm perceiving the wine today and describing what I perceive. Um, and the grid sometimes dovetails perfectly with that and sometimes doesn't. So I just thought we'd th uh, throw that out there. One of the reasons I'm saying that is as I look at it, always against the white surface on an angle, right? Um, to me, it's appearing more like a true pale yellow today with very mild green blends. So it's not telegraphing extreme youth and it moves with some viscosity in the glass. So it's got a reasonable amount of extract, though it's certainly not what I would call um, high viscosity. And I think on this particular wine, I may address um, both uh, aromatics and uh, flavor at the same time, but let's uh, let me put my nose in the glass and tell you what the first waff I get. It is, I tasted this before you all got on. And the first thing that struck me that this wine is unique in that the um, initial attack aromatically is savory. It smells um, almost like a fennel or sesame. Um, you know, I'm not talking um, uh, vegetable soup, but definitely a savory aspect, including saline. I'm gonna go ahead and take it right on my palate. which is what I did when I first tasted it. And the um, textural attack is, I would say medium plus plus acidity verging on high. Very strong mineral component is one of the first things I perceive on the palate. Um, going back to the initial impression, on the palate, um, there is a strong impression of uh, fresh citrus and, um, both tart and sweet citrus. So we're moving into, you know, Meyer lemon, key lime um, uh, territory. The fruit is actually uh, behind the uh, savory element and uh, the citrus element, and it takes the form of um, gentle expression of tree fruit, you know, pears and apples, um, probably more green than not, uh, and maybe some um, um, white peach and nectarine, if I were to name it. Um, again, the floral component on the nose is citrus. So, you know, that matches with um, the citrus flavor, a little uh, lemon and lime blossom. But again, one more taste because I'm finding the savory element fascinating and want to describe it fully. I would say crunchy celery, um, crunchy daikon radish. Um, there's a bitterness to it that's very attractive, maybe like arugula if I were to put my finger on it. Um, 
certainly, you know, savory spices, including various incarnations of pepper. And there is uh, anise, fennel, uh, licorice component that's intriguing. Um, a little bit of exotic spice, but certainly no oak spice worth talking about, or if it's in there, I sure can't pick it up. Um, it is long. Uh, the flavor is actually um, not only persisting, but expanding. And I think there's a little bit of a phenolic component on this wine because it's changing the texture of my palate. I forgot to actually uh, look at the questions for you to consider. Ah, Rocky Minerality, <laughs> there it is in my perception. And I answered my own question. Yay, um, you know, having a good day. So I don't pick up any oak on this uh, at all. I'm curious to see what you think. In terms of the texture, certainly the simple um, answer would be uh, lean maybe even verging and austere with uh, persistent uh, minerality um, that's got sort of a saline character, but there's also a richness to this wine. This wine has shoulders without oak. I would say, you know, the alcohol is probably moderate on it, moderate on it whereas the acidity is medium plus plus to high. So um, there are also fresh herbs, you know, surging forward, chopped up parsley. This is a complex wine that I think derives its complexity from, uh, frankly, the grape variety grown um, in uh, uh, a fortuitous region for this grape variety and the hand of um, uh, a master grower. So I think to that point, you know, both perfume and substance. How cool is that uh, without manipulation and right. the thumbprint of terroir. So we are going on to uh, our first deductive um, I'm gonna consideration. I'm going to pull up the poll. Yep. Oh, wonderful. And, you know, we're not mean. We're just being helpful in terms of everyone developing their own um, ability to perceive. Ah. Oops, oh, no, go back, go back. No, I'm <laughs> trying to, I'm trying to. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Uh, you can't getting say too we, excited. You can't I know, say trigger we having have here. Fun. Yes. So what we have here is we have Albarino and Gruner Veltliner that are, depending on the expression and who you ask, are either semi-aromatic to aromatic varieties. They're certainly not neutral. And Chardonnay, that very much takes its character from where it's grown and, um, you know, how uh, it's managed in the winery. We have a per usual and even split between old world and new world. By the way, everyone, just a reminder, this uh, poll is completely anonymous. Yes. You know, um, and one look at the label is worth a thousand bucks. So please weigh in on what your, um, uh, what your thoughts are about what this is. And by all means, oh. um, press other. What happened? Was there an issue? It's good. You? It's good. I have a very active uh, mouse that is trying to click on. <laughs> Uh, we, we need it when we put up other up there. We're not just being polite uh, because sometimes it's very nice to know what impressions you had that are not um, these options. We've got Spain and Austria to consider for obviously uh, Gruner Veltliner and Albarino and uh, the Chardonnay um, consideration, you know, Australia could be right. Uh, Western Australia, which is a uh, um, an elegant expression or new world California, which can be anything it wants to be depending on where it's grown. So how are we doing on answers, Li Meng? I'm going to launch this poll. We had a very slow participation, I mm -hmm. think, because folks are just getting warmed up. But mm -hmm. most of everyone is in the Albarino and Gruner camp. So mm -hmm. I think when we do reveal uh, mm -hmm. A third are in Albarino, two thirds are in Gruner. We do need to explain the difference between the two and how, what markers are driving you one way versus the other. And then we have folks firmly, I think, in the old world, about 77% are mm -hmm. in the old world. Which is well, good. and the 77% 77 rule, uh, and also the fact that this is not Chardonnay is correct mundo. So good for everybody. Um, you know, the short version on Albarino uh, and Gruner Veltliner in terms of two, what I consider semi-aromatic grape varieties that can on occasion be confused for each other. To me, Albarino, um, one of the um, aromatic elements that um, leads with rare exception is uh, florality, you know, both fresh and uh, dried flowers. 
Um, it shares the structural sensibility with Gruner in that the acidity can run high um, and also the wine can show some shoulder, some muscle without um, seeing any oak, though occasionally some of the ultra premium producers of Albarino will throw oak at it or in it. Um, Gruner Veltliner has um, a, a strong uh, veg component, you know, whether you want to call it, uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom has it white pepper, radish, um, lentil, and, you know, whatever else you come up with. Um, it is a grape variety that can be quite subtle, uh, depending on the quality level. And uh, I, for one, think you are heroes in attacking it because it's not easy to, um, uh, it's not easy to deduce. So Tim would probably argue with me on that. Maybe what we'll do is we'll go to the next slide, see where we're going. And from there, we can explain further. And for those of you who have questions or thought of something else and want an explanation on that, please feel free to put that in the chat. So we're leaving San Francisco. Mm -hmm. We met these from Evan's house. Yeah, we started. And then today. here we go. And we're off. To we slowed this down. So yeah, exactly. So here we are. We are in Europe. We are at Nikolaya, a terrific producer. Um, in the Bacau, which is on the south bank of the Danube. Um, uh, and um, it truly is one of the leaders of this tiny area that's in the western reaches of uh, Austrian wine production. It's in the Nieder Osterreich, the, um, you know, the larger area referred to as Lower Austria, where, you know, what, half of the vineyards in Austria are located. Um, this is indeed uh, Gruner Veltliner. It is... Um, uh, the Bacau has its own um, growers association to which most of the wineries in this area belong, like over 200. Very interesting stuff because they have unique rules behind the Austrian DAC, DAC uh, regulations. No capitalization, no oak character, which I find really fascinating, right? Um, and also they have their own uh, optional method of um, identifying ripeness level, notably uh, Steinfelder, Bettersfield, and Schmarag, and you will forgive my truly tragic German pronunciation. <laughs> Did I do okay, Tim? Yay. This is a small yeah, area. It's only, good. it's like 30 yeah. miles long, super steep slopes, uh, terraced. And I want to mention something before I forget and talk about the grape variety and or Nikolayev, what I find utterly fascinating in reading about this area is the climate because it's completely unique. It's got one of the um, biggest swings in, turn of, in terms of diurnal, um, you know, uh, swings anywhere on the planet. And that we don't commonly think of for white wine uh, growing regions. And that is to a large degree influenced by two currents. We have warm air coming in from the Hungarian uh, Pannonian uh, steep to the um, step to the east. And that extends the growing season big time into like late October, November, which is why they can get big, uh, you know, ripeness levels. And also they have cold air coming from, um, from the north, from uh, the mountains. So uh, there you have it, a combination of crisp air um, and warm air at different points in time. Um, in terms of the, we can go to the next slide. Um, in terms of this producer, Nikolayov in the Bacau. Oh, by the way, this does not have the ripeness designation. It does have Hefe Absberg, which indicates that it's been aged uh, on the lease. And it is uh, 2020, though we would actually accept 19. Why? Because it's showing very forward and very together and very expressive. Um, for uh, a, a very good dry white wine. And this is probably, Tim and I were joking, the Nikolaev's Normale uh, Gruner. You know, it's not one of their ultra premiums, but boy, does it have the thumbprint of a great producer who is the oldest producer in Austria. How cool is that? Can we see the next slide? They've been uh, around. Adeline, just, mm -hmm. I just want to pause for a second. You said, Hefe ba how do you say this word? Hefe abs Absu. Hefe oh my God. Like, right, Tim. Right. Like Bella Opsen. Like Bella Opsen. <laughs> so just, just you said that um, it was aged on lees, and this is yes. one of the questions that's coming up on the chat. There's a fullness to this wine. Would you attribute that to the fullness? Uh, certainly, in part, absolutely. I would also consider it um, an indication of low yields. 
you know, and I'm imagining here, but you know, these folks have been around for, wait for it, 2000 years. This is not just um, a shot for drama. You know, they started in like um, the, in like 470, it was a Celtic place of worship. And then they were owned by, um, you know, Roman fortress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they've been growing for a very long time. And also most importantly, they are exuberantly bi biodynamic. Their entire estate is biodynamic and they are whipping up teas in the middle of the night, you know, made from nettles and horsetail and valerian drops. You know, they're, they're not mucking around. I love this, the phenolic, um, phenolics, I just read that. Thank you, Tim and Jane. You feel it, the texture on your palate. Oh, there we go, a horn with stuff in it. So the <laughs> texture on your palate, right? Um, what, you know, you could um, refer to I guess incorrectly is white wine tannin, right? But you know, the fur is raised on your tongue and it is the result of um, limited skin contact as Tim um, uh, correctly said. This is the gentleman who's running the estate right now. But I think it's a wonderful ex expression of Gruner Veltliner, you know, and if I were in a blind tasting, I'd be saying thank you to my gods for giving me this one, <laughs> especially if I didn't have it too cold because that savory element, the, you know, the very generous aromatics. The only thing that might throw me slightly is that poignant acidity, a little more than I commonly get in um, riper uh, uh, gruners. Tim, would you agree with me there? Yeah, but you know the texture of this wine, first of all, it speaks to, it's a confluence of things that speaks to a, a really top producer working with a great vineyard where the vines are old, the Yields are low. There's minimal finding infiltration, if at all. Right. And you've got least contact going on. And then you've got some malolactic, but not a lot because you don't need it, right? I mean, malolactic to me, or you know, you, you need richness and you need uh, to, you know, put the brakes on the acidity if you've got a high acid wine and you want to do that. But it's also a wine making decision. So this wine is just, it's an example of a, a Gruner Veltliner from a top producer, and this is not even one of the classified wines. No, so. this is, you know, this just shows you how important the producer is. So take away from me, um, you know, if, you, if you're scratching your head when you read uh, the laundry list of uh, typical Gruner expressions, what does lentil taste like or smell like? You know, I think really the takeaway is savory. Can we go to the next slide? Do we have more? Yeah. No, no, that's it. That's it. So uh, I don't know if we addressed everything in uh, the chat, but I tried to be on time. I love it. Um, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, folks, we'd love to see your questions, but I think a lot of the questions and comments are coming in just to the panelists. So be sure when you do a comment to pick uh, to not just hosts and panelists, but to everyone. We're trying to make an effort to answer everyone, but if they don't see the original question, it might be a little hard for them to see what we're answering. The questions were about oak aging, not very uh, often used. I think Tim has answered a lot of these. And then um, Metalectic, um, Tim, you're saying that it's often used in both Albarino and Gruners, right? Yeah, it is, but you know, this you, you can put a certain percentage of a wine through Metalectic versus all of it. So, and I think that's the common practice is that you want that, you want that aspect of what mallow brings to the texture of the wine, but you don't want it to smell like microwave popcorn either. Right, so. <laughs> right. texture, not butter. Right, right, right. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Madeline. We're going to go to wine number two. Evan, you are up. <coughs> thank you. And thank you, Madeline, for kicking us off. I do want to make one just quick comment that, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, Gruner Veltliner, is made in Australia. Gruner Veltliner is made in California. Albarino, although they got it wrong the first time, is made in Australia and Albarino is certainly made in California. So I hope a few of you, because I did notice when I was doing my looking there that there were a few people that were in California, but nobody had picked Chardonnay. And if you felt like you were being singled out for that, I applaud you personally, because I've had some delightful examples of both varieties from uh, the Golden State and from down under. So bravo, bravo to you. All right, wine number two uh, is a, a, a horse of a different color, flower of a different color, if you will. And right off the bat, physically, um, it looks a little bit different. So while it has a, a, a bit of richness to it, it's sort of straw color with its green highlights is, uh, is different, I believe, than the first wine, perhaps being a little paler um, and a little bit fuller. Right off the bat, 
in the glass. I'm always looking as I, I know I remind people sound like a skipping CD here, but I always personally break things down real simplistically to look for fruit and fruit elements. And fruit for me is anything that grows. So it could actually be fruit, fruit, but it could be vegetables. It could be herbs. It could be anything that is organic material by definition. I then look for earth elements, both organic and inorganic. And we'll talk about those when we get there. And then finally, I'll look to the presence of wood and all of its surrounding attributes there. So FEW wonderfully translates into a very easy to remember acronym called FEW. Always look for a few things in a wine and you'll cover off on everything. So let's start with the fruit because there's certainly a lot of it in this wine um, and it's in varying different shapes and sizes. So right off the bat, um, I am picking up, of course, citrus elements here, and they do tend to be sort of a combination of lemony-ness, but also uh, grapefruitiness uh, in the more yellow vein than not, a uh, ripe, fresh. Uh, I'm picking up on all the elements, so but not only the flesh, but the uh, zest of it, and even a little bit of that sort of pithy white grapefruit character, lots of different free tree fruits, say that five times fast, more in the sort of pear and apple vein, but even a figginess which to me is an absolute clue as to potentially something in this wine. I've got stone fruits along the lines of plums and nectarines and peaches, all on the slightly fresher side, not uber ripe, uh, a little bit of uh, tropical fruit, but not that much. Tremendous amounts of floral, uh, again, in the sort of blossoms that reflect the white nature of the citrus and of the tree fruits we talked about before. There's a little bit of uh, greenness to the wine, which you could combo out as some form of varying different herbs, uh, be it sorrel, be it something lemongrassy, be it a little bit more bay leaf-like, uh, ginger root or even ginger powder by nature. And of course, that sort of olivey, capery grassiness that um, all sort of fit into that tight little box of green, which is definitely um, speaking to me here. As far as um, earth goes, I am definitely picking up again what I would call sort of just a, a soft sort of stony, uh, river rocky minerality to the wine, maybe a little bit of chalkiness to it, nothing beyond that, and nothing from the standpoint of oak that suggests anything uh, in the spice cabinet to me there, or that torrified bending of the oak staves over fire that would give it a light caramel or toffee character. I am picking up a little bit of that sort of pine nut, macadamia, peanut shelly thing, which does suggest to me a little bit of least contact, which I think for me, a style of wine like this needs, needs because if you're not going to pick up your texture from wood, large, small, or otherwise, you need to pick it somewhere else, uh, pick it up somewhere else, and Lee's Contact would be a good place to do that. Um, that's really it. As far as the mouth goes, the wine is bright. Uh, the wine definitely has acidity here. Um, I would put it somewhere in the medium plus range. Um, maybe even a little bit more puckery than that, but probably medium plus is a good place to go. Uh, the alcohol on it is relatively uh, light to moderate, probably moderate. Um, my chest is warm, but not um, heating up like a jack-o'-lantern. There's no phenolics here, which doesn't suggest a lot of skin contact, perhaps a little bit, but not significant. Um, there is some texture to the wine, which does sort of reinforce that Lee's element that we talked about before. And the wine um, is bone dry and it, uh, it's got some decent length on it. I'm still tasting it right now. I wouldn't put it as a long wine, but I certainly wouldn't put it at medium, so I'd put it at medium plus. Um, it definitely carries through. Uh, it has a little bit of, um, of earthiness there. And sort of to go back just on some other things that we talked about before, there is that sort of cat pee litter box comment that Andrea just brought up, which for those of you who have cats, you will recognize that if you do regularly attend to their box. But some people might also pick up a note of sort of like wet wool or lanolin or something like that, which is definitely a back note on this wine. If you have had a good sweater and you happen to go outside yesterday in, I don't know, San Francisco, and your sweater got a little bit wet and you brought it into the house, that sort of aroma that would emanate from your sweater is that sort of wet woolly kind of thing too. And that I think is in part what's going on. So uh, it's a delightful little wine. Uh, it's quite tasty. Um, it's not a life changer per se, but everything about it is correct, delicious, and um, enjoyable. Great. Evan, I'm going to show the poll, but yeah. as I do that, can you just explain the dumb question, I guess, for, for me for the day? Explain phenolics. We've mentioned mm -hmm. it in the first wine, and we've mentioned it here. So what exactly is phenolics, 
And, you know, over over time, we've kind of thrown it a lot with, yeah. obviously, with white wine. Yeah, sure. Well, phenolics, if, if you could, th the very most simplistic way to talk about phenolics is white wine tannin, right? And tannin emanates from, from in wine from two places. One could be from the skins of the grapes themselves. Generally, the thicker the skin, uh, the more tannin you will pull out of it. And obviously, the longer contact the fermenting must plays with the skin, the more tannin you will pull out of it. That's why a big grape like, say, Cabernet or Syrah is more tannic than a thin-skinned grape like, say, Pinot Noir or Gamay would be. In white wines, we don't talk about it a little bit, but if you do ferment the wine in contact with the skins, and the skins tend to have any thickness whatsoever, you can pull off tannic or what we call in white wines phenolic compounds out of those white wines. The other place you might get it would be from oak. And if white wine has spent time in oak, it has the same ability to leach the tannins out of the wood itself that a red wine would. But once again, uh, more often than not, um, white wines may not spend time in oak, may spend time in oak, but it'll be larger and older. And if it does spend time in new oak, it's generally for a short period of time. So more often than not, the phenolics we talk about in white wine do come from skin, skin contact, and extended skin contact. Great, great. All right. A reminder, as as everyone, this is completely anonymous. Yeah. I see a very slow sort of uptick. Yeah. I don't know if it reveals a little bit of confusion or what, but take a guess. You know, as they yeah, say in grade school, you got a 25% chance. In this <laughs> case, 25% chance. So what I think is really important to note here is all three of your choices here are blends, which is to say, one of the things I noted in the wine is there was not one dominant element. Um, that sort of piercing voice of a soloist in a choir who sort of takes over. Here you had some fruit elements going on, you had herbal elements going on, you had earthiness going on, you had a little bit of lees going on. You had all of these things which suggested to you the complexity, if you will, of a choir or a band or something, or in this case, more than one grape going on. Um, Verdejo uh, is a grape which comes from Spain. Uh, it tends to be, again, semi-aromatic. A uh, Sauvignon Blanc, also semi-aromatic to aromatic by nature, tends to be relatively pungent by definition, depending on where it's grown in the world. And Portuguese blend could be a bunch of anything. There are hundreds and hundreds of grapes uh, in Portugal, and depending which white wine grapes you want to play with, in blends, they pronounce themselves in different ways. And then, of course, we have our varying things there. Now, don't let that Portugal-Spain thing get to you. Long before there was a place called Portugal and long before there was a place called Spain, there was a place called Iberia. And across Portugal and Spain, they share a lot of those grapes. So even though it might be a Portuguese blend, you might actually find that, as we just talked about before, with Albarino, with Alvarino, if you happen to be in Vino Verde. Well, so here we are. We are at... Um... I think some folks got other in here. So if anyone wants to share what their other is, please do so in your, um, oh, Shannon, Evan, why not Shannon? Well, Shannon, I think you do have elements of Shannon um, in the sense that you have a lot of that sort of apple character of fruit. Shannon to me usually comes off as being sort of like a cross between um, ripe green and yellow or golden delicious apples, but it usually also picks up a note of tropicality, of melon, of almost uh, juicy fruit gum. For those of you who are old enough to remember juicy fruit gum. If you put all of those things together, you usually get Shen in there. Um, it doesn't usually have anything herbal and green about it. Um, it doesn't usually have anything um, super, um, what's, what's what I'm looking for? But it, it'll pick up on other elements of it. You could have more of a pie fruit character. You can have a honeyed element. You could have honeysuckle and different floral things here. But it's really that greener sort of element, which is strongly in the background of this wine that would probably steer me away from it. All right. And so we are at 25% Vadejo and we have 67% Sauvignon Blanc. We mm -hmm. have about 83% old world versus mm -hmm. the rest in new world. So Evan, what do you think? You want to talk a little bit about the old versus new or do you want yeah. to just go? No, no, no. I think I think the old world versus new world merits discussion. Um, certainly the fruit character has the forwardness of being um, new world possibly in personality, but the alcohol level is too low. Um, the acidity level for this weight of this wine um, appropriately and perhaps even a little bit piquant. So I would probably avoid that. And there is this sort of underscoring kind of um, gravelly 
um, stony, rivery minerality there, which you're simply not going to pick up in the new world. So as far as the Verdejo versus Sauvignon Blanc, I think both of those are fair choices. Verdejo, when well made, also does have green elements to it. Um, although this, there's other stuff going on here, which is not Verdejo-like. So let's see where we end up. So we're going to leave Austria. Bye-bye, Austria. Do you know that most all of the vineyards in the Wachau are owned by one winery? That would be Daman Wachau. They own wow. like 80% of the vineyards there. So, so go all those little guys. Have, I know. Go team some, Nicolai. Yeah. <laughs> Won't don't sell. Don't sell. Here we are in France. Here we are in Bordeaux. <laughs> and here we are specifically in the area of Entre de Mer, uh, just outside of the town of Deniac. Uh, in the heart of the Alta de Mer, down in the southwestern part of France. Now, when many of us think of Bordeaux, first of all, most of us think red uh, more than we do white, but there is a fair amount of white wine made in Bordeaux. Uh, most of it is made in the Entre de Mer area, which you can see on your map there, literally sits between the Garonne and the Dordogne rivers um, and is uh, nestled to the uh, to the west, to the to the Gironde, and then to other areas to the east. Um, and this is a, a, a classic area. Uh, the lines here um, are are mostly white. There is a bit of red here, but it's the largest subregion of Bordeaux. It's seventy four hundred acres, which a lot of people don't really think about that much. But it's a very prominent place and is the heart of uh, this area for white Bordeaux production. Um, generally, the wines here tend to be blends, which is to say. They're going to be driven by either Semillon or Sauvignon Blanc. It could go either way. <clears throat> and then you might even have a kiss of a third grape in there, a player to be named later called Muscadel de Bordelais, which sounds like it's part of the Muscat family, but it actually isn't. Um, the wines here tend to be, have a little bit of that, as I said before, wet wool, uh, green olive, slightly caperberry kind of thing. They're not as pungent as what you would find in the north in the Loire, certainly not as pungent as what you would find in New Zealand or Chile if you were going to do a Sauvignon Blanc drive. Those that have more semio in them tend to have a more fig-like nature, and again, a lot of that tree fruit sort of character. And then those that have the muscadel in there have this sort of interesting lift in the back, <coughs> slightly perfumed. And lo and behold, our friends here at Chateau La Frenelle uh, in the Alta de Mer, um, have all three. So it is a Sauvignon Blanc driven blend with ample amounts of Sauvignon and that little kiss of Muscadel de Bordelais, of which this one I believe um, is less than about five, six percent. It's usually no more than um, 10 and, percent uh, on the wine. Yeah. yeah, my apologies. Given what the Sauvignon um, composition is, I think one of our four choices would have probably been Sauvignon, but I think we have been putting Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc kind of interchangeably. Yeah, I, I mean, technically, and the percentages here, I'm not looking at the tax sheet, are probably pretty close. Um, there's a fair amount of semillon in here, which you can pick up by its texture. And again, that sort of green or Adriatic fig character to it. But again, the Sauvignon is picking up on that greenness, a little bit of that wet wool lanolin thing, and the muscadel sort of pops it at the end. This is a killer property. Um, I just found out about it um, relatively recently, although now I feel sheepish. It actually goes back to 1789. So not as old as Nikolai Hoff, but nevertheless, it goes back to the Napoleonic Revolution, where the property itself was a proceed given to a gentleman by the name of Jean Bart, who was a Napoleon uh, army general, who after doing a good job, Napoleon handed it over to him. Eight generations later, they are still making wine there. And eight generations later, after seven males, Finally, they have a female winemaker, um, and that is Veronique Bart, who you'll see in a picture forthcoming. Uh, she inherited the property at the ripe young age of 22 and has been making the wine ever since. Wow. She not only rocks with quality winemaking, but she's been um, pushing them over to its uh, more um, di bio, bio uh, self, as well as the fact that rather than selling off most of the fruit, they still sell off a lot, but they weren't making a state wine before, and now they are, which I think is really quite cool. Uh, there's some really great questions here on <laughs> chat. I'm going to pull, uh, Evan, if you don't mind, Tim mm -hmm. to the forefront, because he's been answering some of these. Tim, um, I want to go back a little bit to Andrea's question on this cat pee minerality. Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to talk sure. a little bit more and expand a little bit sure. on, on what that, where that comes from? 
Yeah, sure. So it's a combination of things. And to explain it, I'm going to have to drag a little personal culinary history into the uh, mix. So uh, when I was a little kid, my mom used to freeze everything, right? Big family, six kids. And one of the things she used to freeze that I wasn't fond of is she used to stuff green bell peppers with sausage and hamburger and onions and stuff like that. And she would bake them and then freeze them. And she'd keep them in the oven. And the bell peppers, if you freeze them, they turn kind of a khaki green. <laughs> and they have a very dry bell pepper nose to them. And that's what this smells like to me. So you can imagine I'm having all these wicked flashbacks. So part of what you're smelling, Andrea, long answer to a short question, is pyrazines from the Sauvignon Blanc, but also from the Simeon and Sauvignon Blanc together, you're getting mercaptan, which is a sulfur compound that smells like matchstick <laughs> or even onions. And that is literally, when I opened this wine over an hour ago, that's the first thing I smelled and uh, was Mercaptan. So it smells like a lit match and onion and even scallions. So there you go. Can I and jump I in about the whole uh, left bank, right bank thing? Sorry, Evan, that cut No, 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 off. go ahead. I'll, I'll pick up after you. Uh, you know, uh, the reality is that if people on the left bank are making white Bordeaux, chances are it's not a value white Bordeaux. Chances are it's quite expensive and chances are there's oak on it. Um, anything yep. uh, that is similar to this expression of white Bordeaux is probably made in the Entre de Mer. You know, uh, so that said, I wouldn't worry about it too much. If you can get to the point where you can perceive and deduce a Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon Blanc, especially since, um, you know, let's face it, Semillon is significantly more neutral in its expression than Sauvignon Blanc is. Sauvignon Blanc is the little elephant in the room, you know that pushes the other children out of the way. But if you can get to white Bordeaux and then um, deduce relative uh, price point, uh, then you can tuck it into Pesach or not. You know, you're not in the upper Loire, yay. I would say in terms of uh, blind tasting the deduction, you're doing great. Last word, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tim for the next couple. But the whole cat's pee thing, the one thing, and again, if you have cats, this resonates with you. If you yes, don't two, have cats, two cats. I have two. Uh, you don't. But cat's pee in general has at once a sweet and putrid character to it, right? And you're not getting that in this wine. If you are, it's really, really subtle. It's specifically associated with Kiwi and South African Sauvignon Blanc more than anything else. If you do get that um, onion-y character also that not only met Captain, there is a strain of Sauvignon Blanc called Sauvignon Vert or Sauvignon Nas, which one of the um, attributes of it is sort of a, 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 a onion and dare I add the word body odor character. Um, and you find it a lot in Chilean Sauvignon Blanc, which they don't tell you. Um, but if it has a lot of Sauvignon Vert in it and you pick up sort of that character, that's not cat's pee. It's not Sauvignon Blanc, but it is Sauvignon Nas. I think I find that um, having 187 ml, I'm here, I keep pouring more into my glass as you guys talk because it's really helpful. So I just want to make sure that everybody at home out there, you know, keep using that wine and top it off to freshen up your glass. But one of the things that's really helpful as these guys are talking, I feel like I'm trying to map and, and, and the point is to map some of these flavors that are so benchmark into your mind um, that Tim, that was very helpful also with that sulfur compound. And Evan, to say that that's not the cat pee, um, that was very helpful as well as you try to delineate the different flavors as you're getting from this wine. Yeah, okay. I can also say that this is one flight as, as your attorney. You need to leave some wine because this is a flight you will want to come back to tomorrow to retaste because uh, there's a lot of information about these wines. Okay, we're ready for wine number three, the first red wine. And everybody, as you tilt your glass board against a white background, you notice, you notice that there's a pretty considerable depth of color. And of course, there's that chemical name anthocyanins, and those are responsible for the color in red wine. And this particular wine has a lot. So my thinking right off the bat is that maybe this is a thicker skin, deeper pigmented red grape. We're going to find that out and see what it means, because usually that equates to other things in terms of the climate and structure and on and on and on. But we need to see that. So this the site here is just setting up some expectations that we need to confirm or dismiss once we smell and taste the wine. We're gonna call this uh, a deep ruby with purple, so red and purple. Notice that the, the rim or edge is a very deep kind of fuchsia or pink purple. 
And it's also fairly narrow, which speaks to the relative youth of the wine. Uh, what else about it? Well, the wine stains the glass to a degree. And in terms of the legs, tears, viscosity, all that good stuff, uh, I'm going to say medium plus. So not a hugely rich wine, but again, we'll find out when we smell and taste. Okay, on the nose. Okay, that's very curious. So I was expecting a lot more darker fruits, but what's coming across predominantly really fresh, ripe, and tangy red fruits, among them things like uh, strawberry, cassis, red currant, um, sour red cherry. And again, they're very vibrant and fresh. There's some black fruit too. Uh, there's definitely some black raspberry, some black berry, black fruits that are very high acid, okay? In terms of flowers, and every time you check floral on a, you know, in a wine, I think you should pull your nose out of the glass because the wine's actually quite floral. And I'm getting both lavender and rose here, and they're fresh. It's really pretty. And then when we get to the other, there's definitely some herbal and vegetal type things, um, probably some bay laurel or bay leaf. There's some mushrooms, probably brown mushrooms. Uh, there's, there's dark leafy greens, like mustard greens or something like that. Uh, there's both earth and mineral on the wine. I would call the mineral just a straightforward rocky stoniness and then maybe turn soil, potting soil for the earth. And then if there is oak on this, it's used, but I detect very little oak at all on it. Okay. Tasting it. Okay, the wine is bone dry, really bone dry. The acid is medium plus. The alcohol is medium plus at best, maybe closer to medium. And the odd thing here, and this probably takes this grape and wine and sets it totally apart from its cousins in the same family, is that not only the predominantly red fruit, fairly high acid, the tannins are really refined, uh, for lack of a better word, smooth. In fact, that's how I'd call the texture, would be smooth and supple. And that's unexpected, given the depth of color. For the depth of color, I expect the more tannic grape slash wine. And I'm not finding it here, which is really, really interesting. Okay, what else about it? The finish is medium plus and the complexity is definitely medium plus. Okay, so what do we need to paraphrase here? We've got a more tart red fruit than dark fruit which is curious given the color. And then we've got a lot of, you know, herbal slash vegetal non-fruit. We've got earth and mineral. But the surprising thing is that the wine isn't more tannic and one would look at the wine and expect more tannin, okay? So that puts the wine, makes it very unique in terms of the grape it's made from. Okay, here are your choices, contestants. So as you look at this, we've got Menthea, uh, which is as, Evan just said a few minutes ago, it's Iberian. It's from Portugal and Spain. We've got Pinot Noir, and we've got Gamay, and of course, the notorious and nefarious other, which I hope you will use from time to time. Uh, your country choices are Spain, Old World, France, Old World, uh, Oregon, New World, and New Zealand, New World. Okay, so cast your votes. Uh, this to me is more of a process of elimination than it is actual deduction. It's what the wine is not, okay? All right. I wonder if every, anybody feels this out there. You know, when you go from white to red, that first red is always a little bit daunting, I feel. You know, it's kind of like getting your, uh, getting your legs warmed up. Probably not for you, Tim, but a little bit for me. No, no. <laughs> I just don't like to go from sweet wine to dry wine. That's hard. There, yeah. there you go. There you go. Um, we have a Malbec option, which, which we didn't list over here. I think that's an interesting call. Um, and also Tempranillo. Tim, mm. talk a little bit about, about these two interesting sort of uh, dark red. Yeah, so, you know, who, who was that? Uh, Vincat, not a bad call with Malbec because of the depth of color and it's purple, right? What's missing is that Malbec is, you know, it's a Cabernet Sauvignon family grape. It's a bigger wine. Even the, you know, the grocery store examples that are sub $10, they're bigger wines and there's more fruit, there's more tannin, there's more everything. And uh, I wouldn't call the texture and the tannin smooth on Malbec. It's just a little bit more astringent. Um, 
And then in terms of Tempranillo, Jane, that's also not a bad call. The thing that I'm missing here is that, you know, starting off the color for me for Tempranillo is raw, Tempranillo is red. But more than that, Tempranillo, again, I would want more richness and more tannin, you know? Um, even if it was just Rioja Crianza, you know, it would, it would have more stuff. Uh, Lisa Hellebrand, why not a GSM? Because there's not enough frat party. <laughs> the Grenache is just, you know, even if it's a basic Coderone, it's going to be about 14% alcohol and beyond and probably higher. There's going to be more richness and pepper and savory and, you know, bacon and all sorts of cool stuff in it. Okay. And I like if that. I can, if I can reduce party. it to simple, they consider the color and the concentration of color on Grenache, Pinot Noir, and Gamay. Just yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. call. Yeah. I think I think that we have the majority. Well, maybe about fifty percent, just over fifty percent, are mm -hmm. on the Mencia camp, and probably because of that, a little bit higher, sixty nine percent on the on the Spanish camp. Um, but definitely for the first three wines, I think the old world has been um, called out more dominantly. So that's a that's a great option. Love to hear what other was, I guess other would have been that Argentinian call for the Malbec. And Barbera, somebody mentioned yeah. in the chat. Yeah, Barbera is not a bad call at all. And a GSM. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great, awesome. All right, so we're gonna Goodbye, go from France. France. Here we go. Bye, France. I love how the rivers all show up nicely. Yeah, isn't it great? Entre de man. Let's hear it for Google Earth. Yay. We didn't go very far. No. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. And Tim, where are we? We are, it, it looks like somewhere between Portugal and Spain, but this is Monterrey. And uh, this family, uh, you know, bought property first in the 1880s and four generations, and they have vineyards in both Portugal and Spain. Uh, they make uh, Albarino and Rias Baixas. Uh, this particular wine is the Mentia in Galicia and Monterrey, and uh, Mentia is the grape. And they also own the, the porthouse uh, Romarich, which is, to me, one of the small but superb porthouses and great values in it. Uh, what can we say about this? This is, again, Mentia. And uh, this is from 35 plus year old vines. Uh, winemakers today, and again, fourth generation, are uh, Marta Castro Pintos and Carmen Pintos. And again, the Pintos family has owned vineyards since the 1880s. Uh, to me, what makes this uh, Mentia pretty much, I think, uh, a great representative of what it is, is again, the red fruit dominant with such intense high color but without tannins and with elevated acidity. And uh, what's interesting about these wines is that I've had 20, 25 year old bottling. So they have great potential to age and you wouldn't think that. Seems like it's more of a nouveau styled wine that should be consumed three to five years, but the wines are definitely capable of aging. So Lisa asks, what food would you pair with Minthea and why? Well, you know, being a shameless carnivore, you know, vitamin P, pork, you know, Roasted pork, pork loin is perfect with it. Um, what else, Evan? That's your specialty. I'm yeah, no, I, I would I would pick you. up on some of the more savory elements that are there. This wine definitely has um, a lot of fruit going on, but it's also got that sort of like um, uh, you know dried Chinese plum thing and the black olive thing and the herbal thing that you brought out later, which really is apparent in the palate. So I would pick up on things like um, actually something with a chutney would be really nice with this, particularly maybe serve that with your pork loin, but even something as straightforward as a basic like tapenade alongside of this would be a, a nice thing to do to pick up on that, pick up on that sort of herbal, pick up on the black olive elements there. And, 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 just, and just again, grilling would be nice. But what's always cool to me about Mencia is that one side of it, you have this sort of, uh, it's almost Cab Franchi like in terms of its herbalness and its, its um, optic, but then the palate is um, rounder and it's richer and it's smoother. And you, you, you talked about the, the roundness of texture, which makes it almost more in the camp of like, I don't wanna say Gamay but, or, or Dolcetto, but something like that there, yet it brings things together. It's a very unique 
variety and one that literally, if it hadn't been for Avro Palacios and a couple of other people, would have forgotten about it. The grape would have gone to, um, essentially extinct. But very much like Alianico and Mastro Berardino in Campania, a couple of people who, who were locally very partial to the grape, not only helped uh, keep it alive, get people more excited about it, and now it's having a, a renaissance, which is wonderful. I think this wine shows us its potential for aging also, because I think the quality of fruit is just terrific. And I loved how Tim led with that tension between um, acid and general tannins. Um, really, thank you for showing this. And I haven't had one that's hugging the coast um, as mm. much. Yeah, they tend to be more inland. At right, they tend altitude. to be more yeah. inland. So this is uh, refined, but the quality of fruit's terrific. And I, I, for one, would be interested to see what happens to it in the two to five years. Who's this handsome gentleman? Well, I'm assuming he's the winemaker, although I have to tell you that finding information about this winery would, took some true sleuthing. <laughs> and uh, only after much effort was I able, you know, the, 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 the entire winery text was written in third person. <laughs> and that's got to be a first. So, and it mentioned nothing about the family and only in finding reviews of the wine did I find out anything. So they're very mysterious. Evan, who do we get this wine from? Was uh, it we get this. This is uh, we get this from Luis Moya, who oh, okay. um, represents small importer. Uh, yeah. Small importer. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And and I actually don't think that the retail price uh, is correct. So I apologize for that error in there. Um, but because it's a small producer, I'm not even sure that we're not. I'm not seeing it in my quick review. Um, so I apologize for the typo in there. Okay. All right, now to wine number four, and we didn't do the questions on wine three, but let's do them here. So what does the wine step the color suggest? And actually that was important with the Menthea. Uh, was there oak used in the production of this wine? If so, how do you know? And how would you describe it? And then what about the quality of the tannins? Would you describe them as smooth, gritty, Astringent, stringent is related to astringent. Okay, here we go. So let's uh, pick up the glass and look at it uh, now. I mean, as you look at this wine compared to the Menthea, you know, there's less depth of color. You can actually see through it. And the color is a very youthful ruby with a little bit of purple and a lighter ruby rim. So again, a, a wine that's relatively young in terms of age, but also in terms of its concentration, just not nearly as much as the previous wine. Uh, very little staining of the tears. I have a lot of tiny little granular things <laughs> floating in my glass, and those are tartrates, tartaric acid. So this wine was, you know, very minimally fine and filtered, probably not fine at all. And there's uh, some bubbles, which uh, could be either CO2 that they added at the time of bottling as a preservative or just left over from malolactic. Again, it speaks to a relatively young wine. Okay, on the final, oh, we have to do the legs, tears, et cetera. And those uh, considerably quicker than the previous wine, so medium at best. So again, everything points to wine that's not nearly as rich, and we'll find that out on the nose. <laughs> uh, very fresh, youthful, uh, predominantly red fruit, a little bit of black fruit, uh, cranberry here, really tart. A little bit of uh, sour cherry, strawberry, fresh, ripe, even on the point of underripe. Um, there's a tiny bit of black fruit here, and it's black raspberry once again. If there's black fruit on this, then it's something that's very lifted and tart. Uh, other kinds of fruit is actually a little bit of what I would call small orange, so mandarin, uh, even mandarin peel. And again, it's fresh and ripe. Everything about the wine is really youthful. There's floral to me, it's rose petal once again. And there's something I would call like black tea, almost bergamot, uh, a little bit of bay leaf once again. And there's a, a hint of mushroom that everybody, you know, here we go. This is a great AB comparison. And, and there's definitely forethought on how these flights are put together. So everybody, if you put your nose in the glass of wine four, and then now go back to and smell the Menthea. And the question you're asking yourself, A, is it earthy? 
And if so, how much compared to the Minthea? And the Minthea, by comparison, is considerably earthier and even more minerally. What I do get on wine four is really a touch of soil dustiness. And, and then maybe a touch of minerality, but really what dominates the wine and drives the bus here is all the fruit and a little bit of floral and herbal qualities. All right, I think there is a touch of oak here, but it's very low intensity and it's used. I get a little bit of uh, what I would call just, you know, walnut skin and toast, a tiny bit of smoke. And then the final thing I am getting, and it really wasn't, I get it on the palate more than I do the nose, is that there is a little bit of carbonic maceration on this. So there's a little bit of, of a really fresh, almost candied fruit quality to it. And let's taste it. Mm. Yeah. Really youthful, tart almost a uh, fruit fruit punch quality Jolly Rancher to the fruit, but it's still very tart. Cranberry, sour cherry, strawberry, underripe strawberry, and not so much black fruit on the palate. That tea leaf bergamot thing is still there. I can actually taste the floral. And now that you can taste, and if you want, you can go back and taste the menthea, but there's very little mineral here. A little bit of soil, and the oak I'm getting is on the finish. It gives it a, a more rounded texture on the finish. In terms of the structure, the wine is dry. It's not bone dry like the previous wine. The acid is medium plus. The alcohol is definitely medium, 13 or around 13. The tannin is medium again at best. Uh, it's a little bit grittier, which must be the oak. And the finish is medium plus. Okay, so let's see what we have here. All right, I'm gonna launch the options here. I really get that cranberry. I love how yeah. useful that is. Okay, so here are your choices, Pinot Noir, Gamay, and Syrah blend. Okay, and we've got old world regions in France and Italy and new world regions in Oregon and Canada, okay? So what I want you to do is use process of elimination with a grape variety and then drive somewhere with it. And the driving part has to do with how much earth and mineral is in the wine. And you have a great example of an old world uh, red wine, the previous one. Mm. All right. I can hear the Jeopardy music going on <laughs> in my head. <laughs> and I, I don't know how to feel about the, um, people are really thinking through this one, if that's confusion or what. Uh, love to see your comments. You like the wine, you know, what are your thoughts about the wine too? Love to see that. You know, just uh, again, to overstate the obvious, Tim's um, uh, very helpful observation, uh, probably partial carbonic on the nose, which was definitely um, confirmed on the palate you know, helps with deductive reasoning because there's some uh, regions and or uh, producers working with specific grape varieties that employ that tactic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, Tim, I'm going to reveal in about okay. 10 seconds. Count that down and we're going to just reveal at least what people are thinking on the poll to help us here. So about 58% are in Gamay. And as a result, I think you can see that the corresponding um, uh, dominant uh, region is France here. And then we have right. a little split of Italy and Oregon, probably to go with a little bit of that um, Pinot and Syrah choice in there as well. Any yeah. comments? Yeah, I'm going to answer Andrea's question about uh, cranberry in just a second. Okay. What about right, others? So what are... others? Has anyone spoken up about others yeah. in the chat? Sorry to interrupt you, Tim. Yeah. What For those of you who answered other, it'd be great to see what else you're thinking of. And we can answer that right off the bat. That's like 17% of you. Yeah. Sangiovese, mm -hmm. acid, 
Yeah, acid is a pretty good thought with that, Jane. So everybody, the question here for all of you that went to Gamay, and I know you went right to Beaujolais. Now I want you to taste this wine for and swallow a little bit of it and go back and taste wine three and swallow a little bit of it and then ask yourself, <laughs> almost use the line from Dirty Harry. Now and ask yourself, how earthy is wine four really? That's important. Okay. And what's the answer to that, Tim, as people are? Wine four is not very earthy at all. Okay. And also, you know, you know, and again, what's uh, we're, we're kind of we're kind of pushing the envelope here, and I hope no one will freak out because there's no freaking out in wine, just like there's no crying in baseball, right? Uh, but yeah, we've got some carbonic here, and I look at this wine, and the first choice is Pinot Noir. We're going to get to it in just a second, and Pinot Noir doesn't look like this, right? It's red, right? It's some color of red. This is red and purple together, and that goes hand in hand with carbonic, because carbonic definitely affects color, okay? And uh, I said tart Jolly Rancher. Syrah blend, I mean, Syrah would be, even in a nouveau type form, it would be just a much bigger wine and would be savory with pepper and all sorts of Syrah things. Okay, so, all right, let's answer some questions. Um, Teutonic for Gamay, no, you know, no, it's not. Tannins here are very mild. I, okay, Gamay is a good call, but you know, there's Gamay made all over the world, yeah? Here in the U.S., several different places, California for sure. Uh, Oregon, I think we can, you know. Washington. Yeah, let's take a look. Yeah, let's review. Yeah. All right. This is great. This is going to require an overnight flight. <laughs> Al Galicia. Evan just did. Evan just did one of the longest ones you can do, by the way. Sixteen hours straight on an airplane. Not so, so, did you fly nonstop to San Francisco? No, I'm stopping San Francisco to Singapore. Oh, yep. that is brutal. Yeah. Okay. So we are in Oregon at, at Ribbon Ridge Vineyard. And Ribbon Ridge is actually the second winery that Harry Peterson Nedry uh, founded. He was a founder of Shehalem way back in, the 19, in 1980. I mean, he was one of the pioneers right after David Lett and that first generation that went up to the Willamette. And they were crazy enough to plant Pinot Noir and everyone told him it wouldn't work. So this is his second winery, and his daughter, Winnie, is the winemaker. And they make Pinot Noir, and oddly enough, they make Gruner Veltliner, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is great. And if anything, I mean, Oregon, you can see the Willamette Valley would be a place where Gruner could work, you know? So this is their uh, 2019, what they're calling their old vine estate gamay. And these vines were planted, you know, I think in the mid-90s. Uh, this wine is put through partial carbonic maceration, which is why I didn't get a lot of it on the nose, but certainly I taste it. Um, it's and unlike most Beaujolais, Beaujolais Nouveau, this sees a little bit of used oak. And uh, I can actually get a little bit of smoke and toast on the finish. Uh, a mere 369 cases. Um, I think it's a delicious wine. To me, what are we taking away from this? Well, you know, first of all, you do find the carbonic. You do get the color from it, the candied fruit quality, the elevated acidity, but instead of going right to Beaujolais, you just don't have enough earth and mineral to get there. Okay. Uh, what do we got? I'm looking at questions. Okay. Um, I think anyway. a lot of first timers, which is exciting, which is the point of Master yeah. the World. I'm glad that we're helping you discover some new things here. What, what's yeah. interesting to note, if I could just, while we're, we're looking at these, these pictures, um, for the longest period of time in California, we had two grapes um, that, right. that we essentially sold off of as uh, that they were Gamay. We had one called um, Gamay Beaujolais, which was effectively Pinot Noir. And we had Napa Gamay, which was effectively also Pinot Noir. So we really had no um, Gamay whatsoever. Then there were a couple of people of which uh, our friend Harry was one, Myron Redford at Amity was another, et cetera, who essentially, um, we won't say how the, the fruit got there, but let's just say it was the real thing. What they called Gamay Noir au jus blanc or black Gamay with white juice, which is what the grape is 
The selection is in, of course, Beaujolais, France. So for the longest period of time, the only place where you could actually get legitimate gamay planted in the United States up until literally about 10 or 15 years ago was in fact Oregon. So they have a lot of the oldest plantings of Gamay Noir in the country. I think you mentioned, Tim, that these grapes themselves, you know, their vineyards, there's parts of the, of the vineyard that are 35 years old. So um, yeah. it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, it just goes to show you that we shouldn't think um, of absolutely knee-jerking a grape to a place in the world to explore where grapes come from. And um, I think this is a grape, given the interest that there seems to be right now in Gamay that we'll be seeing even more of. I also wanna just make a comment um, with Anthony's uh, question about alcohol percentage. So these sleeves are temporary and they do come off. And what reveals underneath is the actual name of the producer. So you've never torn your sleeve off. You can. And right there, just because it's, um, it's a legal requirement, we always put the volume and the alcohol on it. So you'll see that this particular ribbon ridge is 12.4% and right on the label here. There you go. Good people. Yeah, good stuff. So everybody just, I hope, you know, that you enjoy this wine, but it also just goes to, you know, to push the, the parameters a little bit. Um, definitely Gamay, but not old world. And I think a great job at the wine. And Tim, did you answer the question on cranberry as a marker? Well, is, that a, is that a marker okay. for other varieties? Yeah, okay. okay. So let's take a look at it from a little bit higher elevation. Uh, you're going to find cranberry in a lot of red wines from cooler climates like this one, right? And so you can't use it as a marker to get to a grape variety at all. You just can't. In fact, you know, if I can just say, uh, and I think I've said this before, that, you know, the fruit aspect, the kinds of fruit for any given wine are going to be the, the single most subjective thing in the whole tasting process, period. And so if you quiz the three of us, about what fruits we think are in this wine, we're all going to get slightly different things, right? And that's just based on our life memories of various fruits like pear, apple, pineapple, or whatever. That's just how it is. Practically every other aspect of the tasting process is a lot more subjective. The fruit will never be so. Uh, okay, so so to answer your question, you know, cranberry, where's it going to get you? It's going to get you to a red wine that's probably made from grapes grown in a cooler climate. And it's probably going to have higher acidity, more restrained alcohol, probably. No guarantees. Sorry, that's not much of a help. <laughs> no, but I think you're right. I mean, you, find, you, can, you can find cranberry in Pinot Noir. You can find cranberry in Gamay. Yep. You can find cranberry in Barbera at times. You can find cranberry in Dolcetto. You can find cranberry in yep. so many types of things. What they do share in common, I think, to your point, is they tend to be um, moderate, uh, skin grapes uh, from cooler climates. And they uh, they bring out that sort of snappy, crunchy element, which one person's cranberry, by the way, is another person's pomegranate. So mm. I, I think it's important not to get too crazy on the, yes. on the, on the grapes. But the, is, so the point is just the high acidity, right? Mm. In this red wine. Yeah, but the, the and tart fruit and a cooler climate, you it's know, tart, the whole yeah. thing is, is a package deal. Yeah. Great. Awesome. All right. I want to. I'm going to kind of spend a, uh, a move on this wine um, because two things. Number one, um, I want to make sure Madeline gets ample time on wine six, and number two, I want to take the opportunity for us to sort of now that we've got four wines under our belt, move through a little bit quicker. So right off the bat, let's pick up this wine and take a look at it. Uh, coming off the first two reds. It definitely has more ample color to it, although I wouldn't necessarily put it as opaque because I can in fact read through uh, the, the, the less central parts of the, the wine. As I give it a swirl, uh, the viscosity on it, I would say is probably somewhere in the realm of moderate to moderate plus. There's not a tremendous amount of variation on the color. It's got ruby and a slightly, uh, a slightly less ruby core, but it does look like it has some extract and I would certainly be expecting a wine of personality and a gravitas. Think about these three questions as we come in here. Uh, red wines are all described as having red, blue, black fruits, which if any or all do you find in this wine? 
Do you get an impression of pepperiness here? And that could be pepper literally of the red, yellow, or green uh, pyrazinic variety that we talked about earlier with respect to Sauvignon Blanc, but it could also be peppery in the film of like cracked black pepper or white pepper or pink peppercorn or green peppercorn or something like that. Oftentimes accompanying that, you can have a meatiness to the wine, like charcuterie or uh, something of that vein. And then finally, uh, does this wine have herbal character, floral character, et cetera? So let's go ahead and stick our nose in and see what's going on. As far as the uh, fruit comments, I would go yes, yes, and yes. Uh, I am definitely getting red character here. I would put it more in the savory vein of things. So like uh, cherry tomatoes, uh, red plums, uh, both uh, more fruit leathery, but also on the ripe side and uh, a little bit of tomato leaf. As far as blue fruit goes, I'm definitely picking up a, a little bit of a blueberry character. Black fruit goes definitely black plum, black berry, black cherry, a um, lot going on there. So yes, yes, and yes. As far as, <coughs> excuse me, other elements there, uh, what am I getting florals? Uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, picking up on elements of, uh, of uh, violet, lavender, picking up on that sort of whole underbrushy garig thing that we talk about uh, often at times. I'm also picking up on notes of like dill, um, almost thyme, picking up on an interesting thing that I would only, I can only, maybe it's because I just came back from Southeast Asia's as uh, Tim mentioned, but like dried scallop or dried oyster sauce or something like that. I'm picking up elements of that in it there, along with pepperiness, uh, cherry character. There's a hell of a lot going on here. As far as the earth goes, again, fruit, earth, wood, I'm picking up on some organic um, sort of turned dirt, dust on that, as well as a bit of that um, kind of savory minerality to it. And I'm picking up a sort of black cherry thing now, coming back up to me there. There's a hell of a lot going on in this wine. As far as the mouth goes, echoing a lot of the same comments I picked up on earlier, dry, actually quite dry. So although there's a lot of exuberant fruit, it doesn't finish fat, it doesn't finish sweet, doesn't finish overripe. I'm definitely getting more of the pepper king in the mouth. So I'm getting a combination of, of uh, peppercorn, both cracked black, as well as green, like poivre vert. I'm picking up on a, a, a meatiness, um, a sort of jerky or um, beef jerky-like character to the wine. And um, again, that sort of element of, uh, of uh, Southeast Asian, Asian sauce thing that I talked about earlier. Uh, the tannins on it are, are present. They're firm, but they're not astringent. They're not gritty. There's a roundness to the wine, which I attribute in part towards well-managed tannins during the winemaking, but also some oak <coughs> and probably here larger uh, or combo larger, smaller, but rounding oak and not so much from the standpoint of flavor, more from the standpoint of texture and oxidation. The wine finish is quite long, quite expansive, quite interesting um, and uh, really just delicious. I'm gonna leave my notes at that, just taste darn good. <laughs> I like that. This is a beautiful wine. Yeah. Really interesting. As you say, there's a lot going on here. Um, as people are filling it out, we have Syrah, Cabernet, and Sangiovese as and, an option. And yeah, and again, I think that they, they, they could all be blends uh, or not. This one does sing more, sing more singularly than the wine um, that I talked about earlier with my white wine. But nevertheless, um, when we put down Syrah blend, Cabernet Sauvignon blend, Sangiovese blend, it could be 100%, but it's quite possible that you'll have other grapes blended with them. We like to be able to ride both angles for you there. Because even wines that are varietally labeled as a specific grape, oftentimes are not 100%, as we know from our experiences. All right. So what do we have here? Well, if you look at the basic things, what is Syrah all about? Well, Syrah is about a lot of what we talked about before. Cabernet is going to give you herbalness character. It's going to give you a heftier dark fruit character. You may not get the red savory elements that we uh, talked about before, except in slightly cooler climates. Uh, San Giovese, um, there are going to be places where you get it, but um, generally you're not going to find the color level that we're seeing here, and you're not going to find um, the range of... Um, 
dried elements of dried meat, dried fruit, et cetera, in combination with those and the florals, and certainly not that sort of herbal garigi thing that we talked about before, associated places with the associated wines. Evan, I th- I, I'm seeing um, definitely some leans in varieties, mm-hmm. but I do see that people are kind of split evenly uh, at 25, 18% a piece on each of the four regions. Uh-huh. So how would you sort of direct them a certain way or what kind of hints can you give on the region aspect? Of well, uh, I mean, first of all, sort of splitting yourself between old world and new world or old world style and new world style. And I think it's actually important that we hit on that a little bit because it's becoming increasingly difficult to just go by geography these days. There are cool climate areas producing in warm climate places that give you old world style wines. By the same token, warmer areas in traditionally cool places, especially if you were in France this summer, um, for giving you new world style wines. So look for the structure of the tannins in the case of red wine, look for the amount of uh, acidity, how bright or not, how hard those tannins are, and again, the alcohol levels, the weight levels here. This wine, while it has richness and weight, is not overly generous. This wine, while it has um, a lot of uh, an ample fruit, it's not a fruit bomb or a fruit forward wine. So I could see how this wine is giving you a little bit of each and all of them. Working backwards there, I would probably try more process of elimination, um, depending on what grape I would pick, would probably work backwards. So if I was one of those people uh, leaning in the the camp of Syrah, for example, I'd probably drop Italy. There's a little bit grown in Tuscany, but not a lot of it. France, that would be a big place to do. South Africa, a very big place to do. Chile, it really depends, probably be more of a cool climate area um, and would probably scream uh, a little bit more, but also have um, around this tannin. So it might not be a bad place to end up in any one of those uh, three camps, um, probably with the exception of Italy. All right. Well, let's see. And then we can answer any questions that folks have about this. We're leaving Ribbon Ridge in Oregon. And let's see whether we go old or new world. Thank you, Lisa, for your comment as well. I love that, um, that honesty and frankness that you thought. Oh, that we're going, going, we're going far away and we're going south and we're going way south. And in fact, we're going to South Africa and we are going specifically uh, to the uh, property of uh, Chris and Andrea Molina, Molinex uh, in, uh, in Svartland and um, their family's very bespoke focus on Syrah. Um, I think that if you talk to anybody who cares about A, South Africa as a region, B, Syrah as a grape, um, the top two or three producers in this part of the world right now, <coughs> excuse me, the Molinexes would be right up at the top. Um, they produce uh, four different single vineyard Syrahs, as well as this one, which is their more regionally blended one. Uh, they label it as Western uh, Cape Coastal Region, but it really is effectively primarily Svartland fruit. In fact, I think it says Svartland on the label uh, that's there. And what's interesting is they, they use a combination of different very low vigor sites, um, all coming off of either granitic, shale, or schist soils um, in uh, primarily the Pardberg and the Picketburg uh, mountain ranges uh, and the outcroppings there and are just doing a terrific, terrific job. I brought this here because, you know, everything you read about it tells you that it's basically like baby crow's Hermitage. Uh, And if you look at this wine, all of the markers are French. Um, And in fact, for those of you who ended up in France, I would, I'm sure that Chris and Andrea would be smiling right now if they heard you saying, well, it tastes like the Northern Rhone. That's what it's all about. And in fact, it really not only tastes Northern Rhone, but it tastes specifically of what they refer to as the Serene, S-C-R-I-N-E, a clone of older uh, Syrah that has only been reintroduced in the last um, few years down south, but even across the north there as they're trying to figure out where did all the pepper go? Uh, And the Syrahs that were there as climate change seems to be mitigating the Rotendon character that's there. Uh, not a problem with this wine and not a problem with a lot of the great Syrah coming out of South Africa today. I do think it's important that you look at your labels. Um, you see both, as you do in uh, other parts of the world, you see wines labeled as Syrah and wines labeled as Shiraz. Uh, the first wine wasn't labeled as uh, Syrah in South Africa until uh, 1994. Up until then, although the grape goes back hundred plus years, Prior to that, everything was labeled as Shiraz and made in a much more generous style. It was really when they decided to lean in to the cooler, more Mediterranean elements of the grape that you've started to see this whole 
version of Syrah based wines coming there. Um, although Pinotage, for better or for worse, uh, gets all the love there. I think in due time, this will be the red grape that they're most known for. Um, more and more, year in, year out, the Syrahs are getting better and better and better. And if you look at the price tag there, uh, compared to a Crozet Hermitage these days, hopefully that's enough to make this more of a once a week wine as opposed to a Crozet Hermitage, which is more like once a month or once every couple of months of wine. I just want to also congratulate Lisa and Andrea. I think it's great that you got the, the grape Syrah. Uh, so don't sell yourself short and say, oh, I didn't get the region. Um, I think that's wonderful. Evan, there's a question here that says, what gives it away that is South African? What Nothing gives it away that's South African. That's, that's the whole point. I mean, you have an area that's sort of emerging uh, right now there. I think what you're looking for here is people who are embracing whether you're in South Africa, whether you're in, uh, geez, New Zealand, whether you're in Australia, California, um, and uh, Chile. We talked about um, Atacama. Remember, we had a Tabali wine last night. They make a killer Syrah, I might add. That this whole sort of cool climate, Mediterranean climate Syrah thing is really more what you should be looking for. And I wouldn't get hung up. I think um, Syrah in um, modern day Syrah in South Africa is still relatively too new to be pegged to a specific style. But I think the people who are doing it best, this would be as emblematic, symbolic of that sort of Northern Rome goal that they're shooting for as anything else. I, I also just want to add, you know, both Evan and I own another company called Full Circle Wine Solutions that does a lot of services for wine regions. And one of the things that we get paid a lot to, to uh, sometimes to do on the um, projects is to help them benchmark their wines and benchmark regions. Regions are constantly going through a benchmark exercise to figure out what is emblematic. And I like to think that here at Master the World, you're at the forefront of getting exposure to some of these regions that are becoming really good at some of these varieties as well. Yeah. 10 years from now, we're going to be speaking Ooh. about South Africa's South growth. That's first growth in Sora. So, there, Maddie, yeah. I didn't do a very good job of leaving you too much time. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I'm, I'm peaceful. Look at them. They're so cute. Look at those that's kids. Oh, I didn't want to oh, skip that. Oh, look how cute. Yes. Chris well, Andrea, you know, while you're peaks. still on that, leave the kids for a minute. Because I, I have been lucky enough to have gone to South Africa, though, admittedly, about 10 years ago. And the staggering beauty of the, of the place is enough to take your, you know, stop your mind. But interestingly, I think. To me, the point in this wine is to recognize that Syrah is a great world traveler, arguably the most um, really flexible or nimble world traveler of uh, most of the noble red grape varieties. Also, you know, by anybody's, don't let your mind blow up thinking, how the hell am I going to identify, you know, South African Syrah? If you can get the grape variety, and you should be struggling between old world and new world on this one, because South Africa has a little bit of both. There is yep. an earth element in this wine, particularly in Swartland, where drum roll, old vines rule, you know, um, probably more famously known for their Chenin. So if you want to memorize something from South Africa, try to identify old vine, <laughs> Swartland, Chenin Blanc, if you can get your hands on enough, enough of those. But it's really a testimony um, to quality fruit, you know. Evan, they have a, they have a wine wall just like you. Now you just need barrels in your dining room. <laughs> you know what's another really cool thing? There's none of that South African funk that uh, that we village elders, yes. you know, were traumatized early on uh, with the inexpensive imports that came in from South Africa to the United States. This is, you know, yeah. flawless. So that's it. Okay, wine number six, and I have what? Three minutes, five minutes, something. No, no, you're good. You're good. Yeah, Go. You're good. You're good. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I won't tip through the tulips, but I will march through it. And in terms of questions to consider, we've gone back and forth about the red, blue, and black. To me, it's which dominates. And also, don't forget to qualify it. You know, once you can identify a category, are we talking fresh, uh, almost ripe, just ripe, super ripe? Uh, oh, I've got it down here. See, I'm reading my own mind. Uh, and also I'd add to that confected, jammy, you know, um, and then the tannins, we've, we've been pretty good collectively today with uh, qualifying the tannins. So not only putting, you know, uh, medium, medium plus or high on them, but how do they really feel and what do they do to your overall perception of the wine? So um, visually on this, I would say I can see my finger through it almost. That's about it. And I actually am going to compare it to the, the look of wine number um, 
five, and interesting um, hue difference. First of all, wine number five to me is not quite as brilliant as bright, and it looks slightly more evolved than this wine, um, which hmm, giving the vintage, I don't know what that means, but uh, the center is a true brilliant ruby red, and then it lightens um, really no, no um, hue variation. The very rim has purple tones in it. So it's, it's definitely telegraphing um, a young wine and it is clinging to the glass. So we have um, a grape variety that's lending plenty of extract to this. And in terms of the legs, you know, they are um, trudging, right? <laughs> so this is probably an indication of um, some, you know, elevated alcohol, which by the way, I don't get locked up in the numbers. Is it a 14.5? Is it a 16? Is it 11 and a half? To me, it's the impression. And then if you want to um, put a number on it, no problem. But sometimes wines that are high in alcohol um, are utterly balanced. It's part of the, um, the character of the wine. So aromatically in flavor, and that's my my personal habit is to do a little bit of both. I'm, I'm actually mesmerized by the legs because they're still running and they're a combination of slow, medium and high. So there's a lot of extract and alcohol in this wine and they're all stained. So the first thing that just whips my head back is super ripe fruit, dominantly red, um, but a combination interestingly of perfectly ripe and uh, jammy at the same time, hold that thought. Um, so, you know, you have an impression of freshness and you have an impression of ripeness and you have an impression of uh, cooked fruit and maybe even dried fruit as well. And this is just aromatically, um, you know, fresh and dried. Uh, well, I would say potpourri on the swine, though there's a waft of lavender, you know, when you just uh, run your hand through it, who doesn't like to do that? Also, there is, um, you know, savory seems to be one of the words of the today. Actually, I think the word today is pepper. It keeps coming up a lot, but it certainly has to me um, like a olive uh, character, both green and black. Oh, somebody's getting coconut oil. Cool. That might be an indication of a kind of wood, right? Mm -hmm. Cola nuts. So an impression of, um, of sweetness and um, uh, a really pronounced dried herb element, you know. Um, I will say Garrigue, though I'm not leading you to France, I'm just using it as a category. Um, but certainly, you know, Provencal herbs uh, or um, any number of Mediterranean dried herbs. I'm gonna go ahead and take it on my uh, palate before I run, run out of time. There is an element of wood on it aromatically. And um, the wood to me works great in this wine. You know, somebody got coconut oil, I get straightforward like uh, allspice and vanilla, but it's melted in the wine. And I will say I smell alcohol as well. So back to the right theme. Yeah, definitely in the chest. Mm. The attack, and by the way, my personal little trick, I like to hold it on my palate for a good five seconds, even without chewing it sometimes, because I get a plumb line of flavor. The attack is sweet, um, and an illusion of sweetness. I don't think there's actual residual sugar on this wine, but don't forget that sweetness can come from an impression of actual uh, RS. It can come from an impression of, of ripeness or um, the characteristic of confected fruit. And also alcohol lends sweetness to the wine. There's nothing that I taste or feel that uh, that um, is not in sync with what I smelled. And what I love on the palate of this is I get elevated alcohol. I can definitely feel it in my chest. It doesn't shut down the flavor of the wine though at all. It belongs in it cheerfully. Also mouthwatering acidity. Hello, interesting. You know, you might think that those were mutually exclusive. They're not particularly in this kind of wine. Um, dried flowers for sure. And um, it, I would say the length is medium, uh, not because it lacks in quality. I think that um, frankly, the dominant flavors are almost distracting and the alcohol um, might interrupt the, um, the, the length of the finish. I'm gonna give it one more little taste. So in terms of flavors and fragrances, and I didn't define fruit on this, I think, but 
predominantly red, but with blue and black right on its heels, ranging from fresh to very ripe to confected. Certainly floral, both uh, fragrance and flavor. Uh, certainly some savory element, elements. I haven't mentioned pepper, sorry guys, but there it is. Go ahead and uh, weigh in. And I would say more black pepper than not on this one. Um, oak for sure, uh, not strong, but you know, evident. Um, and if I were to guess, probably a combination of French and American, because I don't think um, it's dominantly American. I think, uh, what options are we giving you? Morvedra, blend, Syrah, blend, Zinfandel. And I would pay put slash blend on there too, because don't forget Zin oh, yeah, for sure. and B field blends, right? Where the Zinfandel um, leads. Uh, old world options, for instance, Spain, new world options, Washington state and California. How are, and I like, we would tell you, this is from my little heart, let your instincts um, lead the way on this one. And to Tim's beautiful point, if you're struggling whether this is old world or new world, go back to our friend wine number three and remind yourself of what earth smells and um, tastes like. Um, I would say this has a, a bit of organic earth to it, more sort of uh, dust, dirt, um, you know, gardening type of uh, mulchy character to it. I don't get much, uh, if any, minerality on this for whatever it's worth. Um, are the votes in, Li Meng? Um, yeah, almost. And we'll just give them about 20 seconds. And we have, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that we are very firmly in the new world on this one. I'm going to mm -hmm. share the results. This is a very... Uh, People seem very confident on this one as a new world item. You know, and it's but, interesting too, Morvedra and Syrah are often related to one another. They, one can say it could be a Syrah slash Morvedra Grenache Morvedra, blend yeah. or a Morvedra slash Syrah Grenache blend, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's Zin by its little self, of which 67% of the folks um, weighed in to with 75% saying California and Limang. Let's see if the 80 some percent of you are right about uh, New World. <laughs> oh, we got to leave South Africa on that long, long trip. But we have an aisle seat in business class. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Essential for mental Thank health you for if, you can, uh, if you can finagle it. Um, we, are, we are back in the New World and uh, we are going indeed to California. We are going to Kibera. We are in um, Sonoma County. We are in specifically Dry Creek Valley, which is one of, um, you know, one of the places that adores Zinfandel um, or Zinfandel adores it because this is a great variety that really reflects a lot of places in California. In addition to Sonoma, Amador, Mendocino, Napa, Paso, right? But the Dry Creek expressions, at least if one can say classic ones, tend to be on the powerful side, tend to be ripe. And I think this is a gorgeous example from a producer who's known for uh, Zinfandel, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and Rhone Blood. So it could have been um, uh, GSM-ish. These people are, you know, obsessively organic. Uh, you know, and they grow a lot of vegetables also and sell them to area restaurants and uh, raise chickens. And, you know, they are solar, they are bi biodynamic, they use, um, you know, time honored winemaking methods, notably basket press. Uh, and I think all of that shows in this wine. They've also actually ripped out almost an acre of vines to uh, produce their compost pile. That's, you know, uh, dedication, dedication to that. That's dedication. Um, I want to remind us all that, uh, you know, the, the in issue of Zinfandel being in a blend, this is over 20% Petit Syrah. So, you know, make of that what you will. It will certainly, you know, elevate um, color, tannin, and ripeness. So I think the Zin was probably doing just fine on its own. But arguably the most important thing to say about Zinfandel as a variety, particularly when it comes to um, blind tasting or figuring out why it acts the way it does is that um, it has a viticultural disadvantage um, in that it is um, often uneven ripening in its clusters. And these thin skin berries with compact clusters will have both harsh green berries in the same cluster as those who have reached full maturity. So tra-la, there it is uh, in this wine. There's Hugh Chappelle. 
Um, what else to tell you about Zen? I'm going to let you read about the provenance of Zen Fundel because it's enough to blow, blow, you know, blow your mind up. But let's say that the one thing we know for certain without getting into Croatia is that it is the Primitivo in Puglia. And it's been around uh, first on the East Coast and then in California, thanks to the gold rush for a very long period of wine. And I leave you with one uh, cool fact that because it has no French connection, that's how it escaped the detailed scrutiny of ampelographic centers, uh, such as those in Montpellier, and nobody could figure out where the hell it came from, you know, until re relatively recently. But, you know, cheers to the new world and cheers to our great, because I think this is a really beautiful example yeah. of uh, Dry Creek Center. Madeline, I want to hit one point that you made at the mm -hmm. outset, which I think if you take nothing more from the Zinfandel conversation, mm -hmm probably the most important thing you can take. There is no other grape which is gonna give you unripe, just ripe, mm -hmm. perfectly ripe, overripe, and raisin all in oh, the same okay. cluster, much less the yep. same wine, much mm -hmm. less that. If you ever come across a red grape where you have that sort of rusticity, you have that generosity, and you have all of the fruit types coming at you at the same place at the same time, it's hard to imagine that it is anything else except a Zinfandel. And to your point, that rusticity time. expresses itself in its in the quality of its tannin, which I didn't define because I'm gonna, because it's drying, but in a sort of brambly way. One of my friends says, Zinfandel is like, you took the whole bush and you jammed it into the bottle. You know, you mm. get that bramble bush uh, character. And FYI, the provenance of this wine is a state fruit right in the middle of Dry Creek Valley. Yay. Uh, there are some questions, Evan, um, Tim, and Madeline, if you guys can try to answer those during the chat. And um, hopefully folks are here for it. Uh, Kit 135 is going to be on October 21st. We apologize for the slightly later week. Um, it's just the way the schedule's worked out. I will say that you're going to start seeing Master the World in person live. Um, we are sold out on the first of such events at Gary Farrell Winery, uh, hosted by Evan and Teresa, uh, that we sent out an email, I think, about a month ago. But we are going to have more events, and that is in Northern California. But both Evan and I are going to be in um, New York as well. So if you're on the East Coast and want to join us, in person, we're not doing this uh, webinar, but we're gonna be tasting a lot of Spanish wines um, at a huge event in Mercado. And so, food. <laughs> and food, of course, and, and gin and beer and all kinds of other fun things. So if you happen to be in the East Coast, make sure you check out our last um, mailer. You can always email our customer service if you didn't get it. 